The call comes in at night. The patient, a very sick child. Haitian nurses Natasha and Beatrice speed toward Port-au-Prince's largest slum. Cité Soleil. Anxious neighbors flag down our ambulance. The news isn't good. The patient we're about to pick up apparently has a severe case of cholera, dehydration, vomiting, diarrhea. Cholera usually spreads through contaminated water. For kids and the elderly, it can produce deadly dehydration. Until 2010, Haiti had been cholera-free for a century. Its return has been blamed on UN troops stationed here since the earthquake. Whatever the source, the disease has overwhelmed Haitian authorities, over 700,000 sick and 9,000 killed. But in the last few months, the number of new cases has begun to drop. Doctors Jerry and Marlon Bitar see all kinds of patients at the Bernard Mevs Hospital in downtown Port-au-Prince. Cholera, they say, has nearly vanished. Honestly, it's decreasing a lot. At the beginning, yes. it was a big problem because uh, we have to receive the patient, to put uh, IV, and to refer after. A few months ago, uh, we have no patient coming yeah. for, for cholera. The drop-off is due in part to aggressive new hygiene campaigns and nationwide vaccination programs. And because hundreds of thousands of earthquake survivors have been moved out of the squalid tent cities that once blanketed the flattened capital and elsewhere. These places were cauldrons for cholera and other diseases. Only a few camps like this one remain. But it's far too early to claim victory, especially as the rainy season gets underway. Well, unfortunately, yes, with cholera, you never know. The situation can change very quickly. Water can go anywhere, and it can pass through a latrine. If a latrine is not emptied, it can overflow. Once it rains very strongly, the water can pass further on. It could become environmental. So um, to prevent such outbreaks in the future will take a lot of effort on the sanitation side, water system side, prevention. Unfortunately, a, a big spectrum of different activities and mostly actually by now developmental activities that need to take place in order to really eliminate it and prevent outbreaks in the future. Haiti is slowly rebuilding, but signs of the earthquake are everywhere still, and water treatment and sewage projects lag. This $2 million water treatment plant near Port-au-Prince was started after the earthquake, but became ensnarled in a land dispute and was never finished. Without such facilities, by the time water from mountain rivers like this reach big cities on the coast, it looks like this. These contaminated waterways have helped fuel another disease outbreak in Haiti, chikungunya, a mosquito-borne virus sweeping the Caribbean. Chikungunya won't kill you, but it'll knock you flat for a week or two. And the symptoms are nasty. Ask just about anyone, since just about everyone seems to have had it. This young student, Pierre, fell ill just before final exams last term. To have passed the exam? I passed the exam and I had 61%. I was not bad, I had a lot of points. Chikungunya brings pain to people and to Haiti's fragile economy. This factory worker says he was sick for five weeks and still has pain in his joints. Chikungunya was front page news for months because people didn't know what it was or that the only treatment is painkillers and rest. 
There have been some 65,000 suspected cases this year, but these days folks don't usually go to the doctor, so the number of sick is likely higher. And with the rains, the mosquitoes will rise again. Which won't make life any easier for Natasha and Beatrice, the ambulance paramedics. They're already worked to the bone. And proud. They are, after all, the faces of the most advanced, well-funded sector of Haitian medicine, emergency and trauma care. Haiti virtually became one giant trauma center after the 2010 earthquake, and it learned from it, launching its first ever national ambulance service. 56 rescue vehicles set strategically around the country, paid for with Haitian funds, run by Haiti's public health ministry. Need emergency care? Dial 116. Dr. Garnel Michel runs the dispatch center. Donc la population à partir de n'importe quel téléphone appelle donc et les appels viennent arrivent ici spécifiquement. Donc les appels arrivent de tout le pays. Et la population est, sait que ce numéro existe. Oui, non, il y a un support publicitaire donc tout ça. Donc la population. Et avant ce système là, euh, les gens quand quand c'était blessé, qu'est-ce qu'est-ce qu'ils faisaient? Deux ans avant, quand les gens avaient un problème, un accident, donc on était obligé de transporter en privé, donc par motocyclette, par un ami qui passe. Euh, un tap-tap. Un tap-tap, donc tout ça. In a country with few street signs, let alone street lights, the ambulances don't always make better time. Getting lost on a call is common. This neighborhood is one of the capital's toughest, but the paramedics aren't scared. If you have Jamais besoin d'accompagnement de, de la police. Oui, des fois. Des fois. En cas d'accident. Pour sécuriser la zone. Oui. Mais pas pour en la sécurité de, de vous-même. En cas d'affrontement. Non pas. That's because people see the paramedics as saviors, in the literal sense of saving lives, but also by virtue of showing up in places like this that are forgotten or feared. This woman is dying of AIDS. Natasha and Beatrice get her safely to a hospital, though it's unclear what help she might get there. The ambulance work is exhausting. When they can, Beatrice and Natasha go out to unwind. If it's trauma, Beatrice can try her luck at the Bernard Mevs Hospital in Port-au-Prince, a small but state-of-the-art facility that handles everything from brain to back injuries. Scott Gillenwater is the hospital's administrator. He says this is the first hospital in Haiti dedicated solely to critical care. We do around 2,500 surgeries a year anything from wound cleansing to breast reduction. So we do a lot of laparoscopic surgeries, our directors are surgeons. Uh, literally any surgery you can think of, we have probably done here. There are about three neurosurgeons and four neurosurgeons in the country, and we have two of them employed with us. Gillenwater and doctors here credit the government of President Michel Martelly and the earthquake for putting emergency care on the map. We changed completely the hospitals. It was an outpatient surgery hospital before. After the earthquake, so four and a half years, it's been a trauma critical care hospital. The hundreds of thousands of earthquake trauma cases, the smashed limbs, the broken spines, have long been dealt with. But Gillenwater says such injuries are still common. Some of the spinal cord injuries usually injured in some form of work, whether it's going to and from work, getting in a car accident, getting shot and robbed for money you've made, or falling from a tree, getting firewood or fruit for your family. Are those really the three sort of main reasons? Yeah, those are the, those are the main reasons with spinal cord injury. Shot, um, fall from a tree. Car. Accident on the way to work. Exactly. The accidents commuting usually involve motorcycles. Haiti is awash in cheap road bikes. You don't need a license to drive one. 
no one wears a helmet. On a mountain curve in northern Haiti, the man in the green jacket dumps his bike and his two passengers right in front of us. Everyone's badly scraped, and the driver has hurt his knee. He can't walk. So we take them an hour or so down the mountain to the nearest clinic. And before we know it, we come across another guy lying in the gutter with his motorcycle on top of him. He'd swerved to avoid a dog and apparently snapped his femur. We're off again in search of medical care. Because they saw that we took him, so they didn't call the ambulance. So people are largely at the mercy of, of anyone who might stop on people, the side of the road. Yeah, people with car helping. That's the fastest, anyways. Always. Though maybe not for long. If a traditional ambulance is too far away, a new helicopter service hopes to step in. Helicopter medic and pilot Jordan Owen shows off one of his birds at Haiti Air Ambulance a privately funded project that's just gotten off the ground. Owen says they've flown five life-saving missions so far, including saving a toddler. We had a, a malnourished child that would have had to take an uh, take a 18-hour tap-tap ride from Wanamouth to Jacmel. We were able to accomplish that flight in less than one hour, and we're already receiving the weekly photos of the child was literally a, a, on the verge of death, looked like shriveled up little raisin, and now he's full of life with big smiles and gaining weight every day. Owen says there's lots of work still to be done coordinating with Haitian authorities. For example, in securing a road after an accident so that the helicopters can land safely. But he's confident that will happen. With this service, it's here to serve all populations and it's showing the world that Haiti's stepping up in this health care and also people can feel more secure when they come to visit or if they're coming to invest to Haiti. And I think that that's a, a tremendous step ahead. We feel that it's the, uh, the right thing for us to do to bring this new program to Haiti, set the standard very high and demonstrate to the Haitian people that they're just as important as anyone else in the world. That needs to be demonstrated. Absolutely. In a way, that's the message paramedics Natasha and Beatrice deliver every night as they crisscross Port-au-Prince trying to save lives. That someone cares, that the government cares, even if things don't always go as planned. On this call, all they know is that someone is unconscious. This young woman has a heart condition, family members explain. She needs help with her heart. But when they feel for a pulse, there's none. Finally, they give up. As gently as they can, they deliver the news and leave. But those feelings, sadness, frustration, are for later. The next call for help is already in. America's Now.